Is it on? Is it on? <laughs> Is it on? It just, everything shifts. <laughs> yeah. So, here we are again. All the videos will be like this in the beginning because we are in that mode where you just put the kids to bed and it just got quiet in the house. If you have children, it just got quiet. We essentially just clocked out. And so we got that first moment of peace and quiet. And so it's hard to just be like, turn it on, be like, hey, so welcome to the Craig right. and Cindy podcast. Right. And it's kind of like, you know, welcome to our moment of good evening. That's the vibe right now. <laughs> That's the vibe. It's, we're just life. keeping it real. <laughs> it's the vibe right now. It's that time of yeah. day where mommy and daddy are finally alone and the kids are at bed. And so there's peace in the house and it's really quiet and serene. So it feels like I'm in the library right now. So even right now while we're recording, I feel like I'm whispering or I'm speaking low just because everybody's sleep. Well, the truth is I don't have to. We can party around. Right, because during deliverance, it gets, yeah. it gets loud. You don't try to be quiet for them when they go to bed. But yeah. It's just, we're transitioning right now. The I energy, the us. vibe. Yeah, it's not <laughs> even about the camera or anything like that. We here, so. I enjoy talking about this stuff more so than I talk about the game. The game? The game. Just, I'm a man. I'd rather talk like about deliverance sports? than talk about last night's game oh. or, or whatever. I See, she don't even show. know. I was like, is she that don't show? even know. You know what I'm saying? Isn't this there is, a show named The Game? Yeah, there was, I believe. Uh -oh. <laughs> you know, but for the most part, if you say The Game in anybody else's house, yeah. they know that you're talking about NBA or whatever season they're in. So we enjoy this stuff. So what are we talking about tonight? So Loss. We... <laughs> so we are going to cover the questions that most people ask as they're on their way out after deliverance. We usually have a few minutes of fellowship and people just want to ask uh, what happens next. So we're going to cover some of the frequently asked questions about what happens next and even what has been revealed to us in our own experience in deliverance. That's our first teacher and in our own experience and what we've learned from Holy Spirit as we move forward, even on you know the day after or, or months later, or if a door is opened, or we're gonna cover all of that. So let's jump right in. Okay. I think the biggest question that we get is, am I fully delivered now? Huh. So what I like to say, and I, I think I used to use the term, I used to say, oh, we want you fully delivered or we're going for total freedom. But um, in reality, this is a round of sanctification and sanctification is part of your process. And that process is a process that happens until you look just like Jesus. And so the goal of sanctification is to just continually cleanse your blood, continually remove unrighteousness from your blood to continually transform you to looking like the sun. And so you will always need deliverance. You will always be in this process of sanctification. There are two analogies I always use. One I always use is the analogy of Lazarus. And Lazarus was raised from the, from the dead. He came out and the first thing Jesus told him was unwrap him, you know, set him free. So. He was brought to life. Jesus spoke into him, but he was bound. So imagine the layers and the layers and the layers, how many times the disciples had to walk around Lazarus to get him totally free. So I imagine that when someone is bound and they come to us, we take care of maybe the, the head and the shoulders part. But there's a, there are a lot of things and layers of things that the Lord will reveal to you as part of your process that you'll be continually walking in deliverance for the rest of your life. And so I think that what he shows us in the beginning are the things that I believe that he feels are hindrances in the beginning to your process. And as you walk out the door, you'll be set up for success. You'll be educated. You'll be knowledgeable about some of the pitfalls and the things to look out for. But for the most part, I like to say that the person is optimally delivered rather than fully delivered. And I'm, I'm, I'll let you chime I, in. So how I would explain it is there's so much depth 
um, you know, we, we hear, we see in the Bible multiple times how the Lord examines our hearts. And so imagine he's doing along with us in the Holy Spirit, a heart surgery, very surgical. Like when he gets deep inside of me, I'm just like, man, he's like deep in there. And so we can't cover that in one night. There's so much depth to that. We could walk you through forgiveness, but there's so much, especially with the people you forgive, you know, there's going to be some people that they only did one thing to you, but then there's going to be people who are in your life, mom, dad, siblings, spouse, who their hurts might go deeper than what you could share in one night. And so you're going to walk through a lot of those wounds with the Holy Spirit. We can't do that in one night. It's, it's impossible, but we don't have to because he's the one who's going to guide you and he's the one who's going to lead you into all truth. So I believe our ministry and the ministry of deliverance around the world is just, it's the way I see it is it's kind of like a, a speed train. Like we could go through all of this with Holy Spirit without a deliverance ministry, but going through deliverance with an experienced deliverance ministry, it's like a speed train with a, lo a lot of things go uncovered, a lot of things get exposed and you learn authority and you learn how to come above them instead of being stuck below them. And it moves you so quickly into a whole different really dimension of, of reality, of identity, of, of healing. That's really what this is. So can we cover everything? No. But does it cover a lot? And does it move you to a whole different area? Yes. Like you said, and we'll cover a little in, in a few moments. How do you move forward? How do you keep going yeah. once you leave? I think essentially also is that um, there's just a level that that the Lord is is looking for you to yes to walk out at yes like there's a particular level of freedom that He needs you to walk in so that you can move into your next. I look at it as when you walk out of our house, you are. As you cross the threshold and walk out, you're crossing the Red Sea is being parted and you're, you're walking out into the wilderness. And the wilderness, as you remember, is just a period of time where God took them out of Egypt, but now it's time for him to get Egypt out of them. So the wilderness season is that season where they're looking to continue to free you up, but to free up your mind and free you of any other bondages that you might still have even post deliverance from your Egypt. Some of that is determined on how much information you share, how vulnerable you're allowed to be. I think on the last video, I kind of was speaking about the difference between a man and a woman and how, how we communicate. Oftentimes the woman is just very much more detailed in her communication, whereas the guy, it's up to us to ask the right questions. And so we typically might have a more thorough and productive ministry with a female versus a male. And so sometimes it determines um, it's determined by the individual and how they communicate or how much they want to share. But for the, for the most part, I think about a story, and I believe it was in Exodus 20, 23, in that area. But basically, the Lord is telling the Israelites that as they go into their promised land, he's pretty much saying, you know, I could just handle all of this for you and just clean out everything and and just do it all for you as soon as you step into this area. But the truth is it wouldn't be in your best interest. That's analogous to the fact that the Lord is very gentle. He's very loving in how he delivers us. He's not the snatch the band-aid off type of guy. So when he says that, he's basically saying, yeah, I could like fully deliver you and wipe out every single thing that is, is hindering you but this is the best way to do it. He promised them that they would live in houses that did not build and they would, they would reap a harvest that they did not plant, that they would drink wine from, from, from vineyards that they, that were not even theirs. And so I think about what would happen if as soon as they stepped over the Jordan, all of a sudden every enemy left, it would take years for them to actually come into all of that vast amount of territory. And so in the meantime, what would happen is there would be beasts that would take over the territory of the field. The vineyards would go unattended. 
the homes would probably be like cobwebbed and vacant and look like a mess by the time they got there. And so all the benefits that they would have from just going into a territory, taking over that territory and being able to, to There's a lot of dogs in our neighborhood. Our dog was snoring, so we had to kick her out. <laughs> What's funny is that the owners be just as loud. They're like, hey! Right. We know their names. <laughs> God essentially tells his children that we're going to take this one territory at a time. Because if I come into the land of Canaan and I just wipe all your enemies out, the time that it would take you to occupy all this space in the years. And in that time, you would not be able to benefit off of the harvests. It's actually of, of your benefit that the enemy is still there tending the land, living in it, keeping the territory right, farming it, keeping the wild beasts out of it and allowing them to do that. And so they're essentially maintaining and holding on your blessing until you walk into that territory. And so that's pretty much what this journey is about is walking and moving into various territories of our life. And as we conquer one territory, then he prepares us to conquer the next. So if they just came into Canaan and all the enemies were wiped out, they would eventually get to certain territories and find that there were beasts that had taken over certain territory, find that there would be nothing to benefit from the land or from the vineyards that had been planted. The homes would probably be run down and unattended to like it, things would be a mess and they wouldn't really be able to benefit in the way that he had planned for them to benefit. And so there was just a tactic and a technique in the way he wanted to deliver that promise to them. So he's the same with our deliverance in the different territories and areas of our lives that he wants to deliver us in. He wants us to move into certain territories and conquer those areas before he moves us into the next. In a deliverance session, you're conquering a particular territory and then you're being educated on how to move forward and conquer the other parts of the territories. And so if you if you hide stuff and if you try to take things into one territory from another that you hadn't been delivered from or that you had not conquered yet, he's going to prevent you from moving into that next territory until you've conquered it. The goal is one territory at a time, one area of your life at a time. And so you'll find that he's a God of process, and that he's very much a God of order. You'll find that it's very much premeditated in the way he goes about it. And so when you come through deliverance, there's a level of deliverance that you're to achieve before you move into your next. And after that, there'll be levels of deliverance, levels of deliverance until you move into your next and then your next. And it's just a journey of moving into your next. And the Bible calls it glory to glory. But it's, it's about moving into the next level of territory. So I think, um, I don't know if this is a different question or if it ties into it, but I think a more specific question that people would have is, am I still being oppressed by demons? When I leave, am I, are demons still oppressing me? I think we're talking about the larger picture of, you know, of working out our salvation with fear and trembling, which includes all of this, but people, because they just left deliverance, they're wondering if they're still under the influence for the oppression of demons. Yeah, I think for the most part, for the most part, I believe that most people don't come in here believing that they're like under oppression. Most people believe that there's this level of freedom that they want to walk in. People come in here saying, yeah. I just want to be the best that I can be and, and whatever is there that I that don't need to be there, I want cleaned. And for the most part, I still believe that people feel strongly about it just being about cumulative freedom. Am I walking in full freedom now? Or unless people are just knowing that they're demonized, they don't really speak that language until they've maybe seen themselves manifest a couple of times. Then they're just like, oh, I didn't know that those guys were there. Yeah. And so once they know that those guys are there, they're kind of like, is anybody still in there? Yeah. That's so kinda, that would be the question. That's kind of like they walk out wondering, like, did we get all of them? And the truth is, is, is that you fight this fight for the rest of your life and you definitely walk out of here with the tools yes. needed yes. to combat the enemy and to to fight the fight, to continue to fight the fight and even maybe help others, you know, like your family members or, or, or your children or 
or be able to be the priest of your home and to, to create a culture in your family. And so we think education is very important to make sure that you walk out equipped to fight. Yeah, we don't want you walking out ignorant thinking that you're just totally free. No demons gonna ever touch you again. We actually bring you into the realization of the demonic. You yes. come into a true realization that this stuff is absolutely reality. You might come in here believing that there's some things that need to be handled in your life. Maybe you come in here believing that there's some delay that's happened in your life or there's some generational curse, but the reality of the demonic becomes very real to you. So that's probably why people walk out like, did y'all get them all? Yeah. And I think one of the great things about our deliverance ministry and hopefully others too, is that we take our time in, we mentioned in the previous video and really exposing, um, the blind spots and really trying to bring clarity into strongholds because we don't we don't really understand what would give space or access to demonic influence in our life so i believe walking through this process and even learning as you go even with the questions that we ask and and the revelation that we receive during deliverance just that exposure alone and the education alone teaches us about spiritual warfare in a way that had us bound just by ignorance. You know, when people perish for the lack of knowledge. So that alone, I think is so much more valuable because it's like, yes, there's demonic influence. I could be tempted to use my mouth to say a white lie. You know, it seems like it's innocent, but something is influencing me to to say that white lie. But now that I know that and that I understand it and that I am partnering with it and I'm coming into agreement with it and being allowed to be influenced to now bring it into this earthly dimension that could be seen and heard, just having that exposure and that understanding, your, your level of authority, your level of fight within you to not be used in that way or to fight differently or to even communicate with people different or or have relationship with people different it's just it's like we, yes we can deliver you but those tools that you have now i don't know it's <laughs> you're you're essentially coming in here to be educated and for a perspective shift yes. in reality yeah like just to have the wool pull from your eyes so that you can see what that's happening in the realm of the spirit so that you can really see how real this stuff is because nothing has changed and nothing's gonna change except your perspective yes. and the tools that you walk out of here with. Other than that, spiritual warfare is, is so real and it's happening in your home right now, whether you know it or not. But when you walk out of here, you're gonna be able to recognize it yeah. and you're gonna know what to do. And so it's, it's actually more important that you walk out of here equipped with tools yeah. than you walk out of here with like every sing single curse canceled and every single demon casted out. It's better to walk out of here knowing that that's not possible to do in a night, but to walk out of here knowing that when things happen and when things arise or pop up, you know what to do and how to handle it. And the threat of, of spiritual warfare, the threat of the demonic, that's another perspective shift that you'll go through. And I think it's very important for you to see that it's not something that you should be afraid of. And so when you walk out of here mm -hmm. with less fear and, and more, more knowledge, more a step up in your authority, that's really what you're here for. That's really the benefit, I believe, of a session or a night with the Dawsons, essentially. So that's a perfect segue into our next question or our next um, subject is okay now i've left and i've had the tools but maybe i don't feel comfortable or confident in my discernment about you know what's fighting against me mm -hmm. and so i think now we could cover what we've termed or coined as moments of grace yeah yeah i, th I think that discernment is definitely a valuable asset to have in, in warfare absolutely helpful for us in sessions but as you as you walk through life there are just other ways that that god will communicate to you and let you know when you're up against something and so our goal is to equip you 
when that thing arises. And so a moment of grace is a moment where it's evident that, well, first of all, you're going to walk out of here with a certain level of peace that you've never yes. experienced in your life. And that level of peace becomes your barometer and it becomes the standard of your expectation of how things should just feel throughout the day. So when that peace is interrupted, you should know and understand that something's happened in the spirit realm. There's something happening. And for you to stop, once you realize that you stop and you assess, and I, I tell people, assess your emotions, assess what you're feeling right now, assess what exactly just happened. And when you do that, you can, you know, maybe you had some road rage and you honked your horn and you cussed somebody out of, out of your window and you can just tell that peace was disturbed. So you can pray into that and just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you what was that. So in that moment, you might have felt anger. You might have felt impatience, frustration, whatever energy you felt you in that me. moment. Yeah, you can just know that, OK, well, these are the things that interrupt my peace. These are the spiritual entities that I need to war against right now. After you've repented and you've done the prayers and stuff a hundred times at our house, then now that you're out in the street, you should know how to do that. You should know how to repent. You should know how to go after that particular entity that has interrupted this, this kingdom space or this space of peace. And so you basically want to grab it, shackle it, throw it out so that you can come back to that level again. We call that a moment of grace. It's an opportunity for you to recognize what's disturbed your peace and know how to do something about it. And if you stay consistent, it'll be, it'll be so in your face. It'll just You can't deny it. Even your kids could call it out on you like, why are you angry? Why are you upset? Why are you frustrated? Use those moments. And I know, I know it's challenging. I know it's hard. But if you tackle it right away, you set the boundary with with the warfare that is coming against you. Like, no, I will not partner with you. Lord, forgive me that I even allowed myself to be weak, which happens and you know we boast in that weakness, but we don't stay in that weakness. Give me strength to get over this anger and this road rage. I don't wanna partner anymore. And whatever spirit was trying to influence me in that moment to go back to my old ways or to even spread hate towards someone else, I, I, I rebuke you, like flee. It really is that simple. It really needs yeah. consistency in that, staying in that and appreciating those moments is gonna get you in such a greater depth and confidence in your discernment. You'll see it so clearly. I think that recognizing those moments of grace and I think that you using your peace yeah. as your, your barometer, as your standard, I look at that as like the training wheels on someone's discernment. And so that's kind of like you can ride with the training wheels for a while and then eventually you just won't need that. And you'll just be able to assess and discern because you'll just be so familiar with that process and the expectation to know that this is now a lifestyle. You're walking into it and knowing that this is my life now. This is how we do things now. Having that expectation is very helpful and very realistic. All right. So I think the next, it's not really a question. Yeah, the next, not, we're not really doing we're FAQ. Doing we're kind of just recommending like, yo, yes. this is what we the recommend. The next recommendation, which I think is the most important, is how do you move forward now personally? How do I get my own oil? I'm thankful for the Lord for bringing you to this ministry, but now you're out there on your own, meaning without a ministry. So how do you get your own oil to keep going, to keep increasing so you won't be tempted really or not weak in your temptation? I think that it's it's really about just plugging in, making sure that you're plugged into some form of discipleship. You're looking for some house that you can submit to, somewhere that you can learn and just continue to grow. That's essentially just mandatory. You got to plug in somewhere. You got to seek discipleship. You got to look forward to growing. And there, or even, even if you don't find it right away, you also need to establish your prayer life and reading the word. That is of utmost importance. And there are many people who come in and, and they are in their word, but there's people who come in who haven't touched the Bible in 
a long time. And you need that because that is where your truth is. That's how you learn God's ways. And it's so easy to trip up when we're walking in our own understanding, you know, aside from God's word, because there's so much noise out there about, especially against the church, the body. But if you, you're established in the word, it doesn't matter what anybody says, you're steadfast, even in your obedience. So that to me is the utmost importance. And I think what's what's crazy is that we do get people here that do have a level of, of, of excellence when it comes to yeah. their prayer life and, and their Bible study. They come in with their Bibles, quoting. We see pastors, and so we, we know that there are levels to it. What I like to add is, is to understand that if you haven't had deliverance, there are things that your eyes have not been open to spiritually. And so when you have your eyes like, wow, spiritually open, Father, show him that there are more for us than against us. When your eyes are open in, in this way spiritually, when you look at your Bible, yeah. if you've read it three times back to front, when you look at it tomorrow morning after deliverance, there will be so many things that you have never seen yeah. that you couldn't believe that you missed. When your spiritual eyes are open, it just becomes a, a whole nother connection. And it's the same with prayer. But your prayer life, will be so changed once your eyes are open spiritually to to the realm of the spirit, to spiritual warfare and the realities of it. And so your prayer, meditation on the word, these things will be game changers and they'll change whether or not you've increased how many hours you pray or, or any of that stuff. It, it's going to change just because of the perspective shift that you'll get from deliverance or after deliverance. If I could add something, it might, you know, because so much changes and, and your spiritual eyes are open, it might not be easy to find a church uh, yeah. or, you know, a house group. And so we are here. We're starting uh, videos. So we are trying to get information out there. I know we can't connect with everyone. We do connect with a few. There's a few people that we've stayed in touch with. But if the Lord leads you, maybe you could be one of those people, you know, because yeah. you will start you, you will start seeing things different. I think that's the hardest thing, actually, because most times people that come here that are bound already belong to a house. And if they're bound, it's very likely that deliverance isn't something that they do where they come from. And so once you leave here free and you see that the thing that you needed wasn't where you were going, and you start to see things differently and your perspective is shifted, you might not feel comfortable at that home anymore. And so you be, you began to seek out other avenues and other places to get your, what am I looking for? You, you, you find, you look for another home essentially. It's almost like you outgrow where you came from. Your spiritual house becomes, I don't know how to say it, but you really feel like you've outgrown it and, and you need something else. And it's very hard to really find a good, solid spiritual house where you can find healing and deliverance and people that that believe in what the Bible says, people that believe that that the Lord still heals disease today and that that demons and, and angels are real and, and that speaking in tongues is actually beneficial. And, you know, to find houses like these, it, it, it gets difficult. And we find that there's so much religion out there that is. It just can get discouraging at times, but I find that when you have your personal relationship yes. with the Lord, yes. that's key. Yes. That's the ideal situation, and, and that's what He He desires. Yeah. You know, you'll find your tribe, and and that'll gravitate to you in time. You know, but one thing you can do right away is make sure that you're in His Word, to make sure that you are obeying His Word, to make sure that you are drawing closer and continuing to just move into your your next territory. That's key. Yeah. I mean, and that's really what sanctification is. You are so connected to him and so plugged in that you could continue in that process. The whole process of salvation and everything that it includes, you grow so much deeper in connection to him because you see how much you need him for yeah. everything. Everything we're mentioning is, is really just leads back to our own personal time and space with him. I believe church is good. It really helps especially for those who need fellowship, who need encouragement. But even that 
in your growth in that, it's going to lead you back into your a relationship with him. And that's really how you walk out everything. Yeah. Deliverance, sanctification, like the whole process. Like you can't do it without him. Yeah. You can't be separate. Yeah. And when you walk out and you've seen the drastic change and your eyes have been open and you've seen what he has done for you, it creates this connection and this love and this affection that this is the best time to, to jump into this practice because you walk out in gratitude, you're thankful. It's so real to you. And so it's a, it's a great jump start into walking into this deeper relationship with him. Yeah. Okay, so the next one would be a question. How do I reopen a door or doors? So what I have here, I have four things. I have sin. Yes, sin. <laughs> I have pride and stubbornness. I have lack of ongoing repentance, so just stopping the process altogether. And offense or unforgiveness, bitterness. And all of these things are sin. And so, yes, you can absolutely walk out of here and be back in the same situation again. And the truth of the matter is, is that you can walk out of here and come back. Well, I won't say come back, but you can walk out of here and put yourself in a worse off position than you were before. You know, so the, the Bible is very clear. And Jesus talks about when, when a spirit, an unclean spirit leaves a person, he wanders for a bit. But he eventually tries to come back and check out and see what his, what his old home was looking like. And if it doesn't look, if it looks swept and clean, it doesn't look like it's been filled with the Holy Spirit and, and good doctrine and, and, and good solid word. And he tries to come back. But it, what it says is that he goes and finds seven more wicked spirits. And then he comes back in. And so you, you can actually find yourself in the worst situation if you don't walk in this alignment we're talking about, walking in prayer, getting in his word, living a life where you take advantage of these moments of grace, like doing these things, plugging in to discipleship, making sure that you are serious about the Lord being the head of your life. These things are all important if you don't want to slide back or backslide. It's pretty much the opposite of repentance. And so, yes, you can undo things. It's all conditional. It's, you're either obeying or you're in disobedience. So obedience brings upon blessings. Disobedience brings upon curses. So I think that things are definitely different when you reopen doors because a lot of what we cancel are generational curses and things like that. But the temptation can always be there. It just won't be so in you to, to fall to them when you're set free. But you still have free will. You can still yes. choose to get caught up. And so it's still up to you. There's no autopilot to this. It's up to you. If, if you want to partner with something, if you want to get caught back up, it's there for you. And I believe that the things she listed, like pride and stubbornness, those are the things that'll get you caught up. Offense will get you caught up because it'll cloud your judgment and you'll make a decision that'll get you caught up. And so, yes, you can absolutely fall back into it. And focusing on the how and the details of that is less important than understanding the importance and the necessity of moving forward with him. If you're not moving forward with him, you're not just going deeper in the word and going deeper in your time in prayer. It definitely can be easier to, to slide back into the old habits and the things that, yes. that brought us here in the first place. Yes, yes very much. I believe... Some people might, who come through deliverance might believe this is just our theology or our way of doing things, our choice in life. But really, we're just, everything is based off the word, the word of God. Everything is based there. One, one story as you were talking that came to mind was the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Um, you know, Jesus pretty much removed everyone else from the room. And he said, you know, no one can condemn, neither do I. But then he told her, go and sin no more. Yeah. Now she had the choice. She had a moment with Jesus. She had an encounter with Jesus yeah. face to face as, yeah. as you do in deliverance, as you do in healing, as you do in, 
you know, in so many moments that you, his kingdom comes and you have a moment with him, but you could still decide to go back to that man. Yeah. You could still decide to go back and your whole trajectory of life is now different. So she had a, a decision to make. We don't know what decision she, she made, really. We don't know if she went back to that man, but he told her, go and sin no more. And that's what we need to know. Like, what do we obey? What is he telling us to do? And you have to follow that. You have to choose to follow that, to obey that. Because if not, there are consequences. He said that, you know, God will not be mocked. You will reap what you sow. Okay. The next one is, can I still get tempted after my deliverance? Yeah, I think it's pretty much the same question. Yes. You know, you can be tempted. And once again, it's still your choice. You can be tempted and you can decide. It's just the temptation isn't as intense That's if right. you've been delivered. Let's say you come in and you're addicted to alcohol and you've been set free from that or, or you're addicted from, to pornography and you've been set free from that. Temptation is is always around. There'll always be cigarettes around. There'll always be indecent stuff on the television or on your computer. But the yearning and the, the addiction or the need for those things, that'll be gone. They'll try to get back in. So it's for you to to say no and to turn away and to to flee the appearance of it. But for the most part, the temptation I don't call it temptation if you put a cigarette in my face because that's just not yeah. something that's in me to, to need. And so it's not temptation anymore. But I guess I'm being tested. Maybe he's trying to turn me on to something. But for the most part, I believe that when somebody's healed and delivered from a particular sin, I, I like to say that it's a desperate attempt for the enemy to get back in because if I've been delivered of that thing, it's just going to be really hard for him because the taste is not in my mouth if I'm set free from that thing. And so they want a home. They really want a home. They really want to get back in. So they will try. Is that temptation? It's not the same, but they're going to try. They are restless outside of a home. They are restless without your body. And so they'll absolutely try to tempt you so that they can resume their residency so the way i see it and explain it sometimes is that prior to having this knowledge of spiritual warfare we are really under the influence of any type of unclean spirit because we don't know <laughs> you know they're just tossing us with the waves and you know for generations i've been doing yeah. that for our family and keeping us in cycles but once you know and you see them now you recognize them so much easier and now you realize that there is an authority that you have because all authority is under christ and you know you've you've received them so now you have authority to very easily just say no to them it's almost ridiculous how much understanding you have of the power and authority of christ and how satan and his demons like have so little power they're just little school bullies one thing that I want to just share is the story that I shared with you about Wigglesworth, one of the generals. He shared a story that he was in someone's basement. He traveled so much and he was sleeping in someone's basement. And he woke up in the middle of the night and he saw Satan right at the edge of his, of his bed. And he looked up and he said, oh, it's just you. He went back to bed. That's simple. It really is that simple. But he will really trip us up prior to understanding this this warfare of just trying to bring in fear, trying to bring in, you know, and you could really just be like, you're funny, go away. You yeah, I, I think it's also crucial to, because what you're talking about comes upon revelation and us spending time in the word and, and really yes. being indoctrinated with the good stuff. Yes. Like to really be eating the food, to really getting that bread. But I think the benefit of coming here and actually experiencing deliverance, witnessing spiritual warfare for yourself, you get to actually see it. This is what the devil doesn't want you to see, is that the cosmic conflict is not a competition. You will not see me fighting with a demon. You will see us taking authority, and you will see that we have no fear, and that the demons obey. And so if you witness someone taking authority, if you witness a pretty woman 
taking authority, smacking demons left and right like it's nothing, like that will change and shift your whole perspective on warfare. It will shift your whole perspective on the authority that's been given because we'll model it for you. You may not have read a scripture about your authority or know anything about it, but if you see, if you come to our home and you see that team kingdom of light versus kingdom of darkness, that there's no competition. And if you see for yourself with your own eyes, the spirit obey. Yes. And when we command and when we speak, you see that they don't, if they challenge us, it's just them talking. If you see that and witness that for yourself, it will increase your confidence and you will actually see and have witnessed someone walking in that authority. And all we're doing is saying, look, you have the same authority and we've actually just taught you everything we just did. Mm -hmm. And so you just coming here and witnessing that it's, I look at the benefit of this as more of such a college level crash course you know, on spiritual warfare that you get to walk out of here with. And it's a, an intense course because it's, it starts at 7.30 PM and sometimes ends at 3 AM. Like she said, it's impossible to do all this stuff in one night and we never do. We look at midnight and we're still in the fight. But at the end of the day, they will see or you will see that the kingdom of light is far superior in its power and authority than the kingdom of darkness. Everything else that you see is an illusion and it's a lie and you, you're being indoctrinated. And we're gonna, we're gonna expose that when you come. Right. If I could add one very important piece of knowledge is that the biggest temptation after deliverance, especially mm -hmm. possibly throughout life, is going to be familiar spirits. Family. I was about to say family. <laughs> family. Yeah. Um, you're going to recognize, at least from personal experience, you're going to recognize the things that you were delivered from that are still rampant. And maybe, maybe this ties to the next question. Yeah, that is. It uh, does tie to yeah. the next question. Does this deliverance cover other family members outside of your immediate family? And the answer is no, they have to come into repentance as well. So it really just covers your bloodline. So us, our children, their children, which it's completely worth it. Yes, I wish it would cover everyone else. But if my children don't have to go through it and their children, their children don't have to uh, even be aware of the cycles that, you know, came before me and that I even experienced myself completely worth it yeah. so because other family members are not delivered it is those same family members that will bring the biggest temptation in life because you're familiar with their the cycles that they're in yeah it could be addiction it could be fear it could be rejection and it's just how they speak to each other it's just you know so it, it might not lure you back in but you might get offended by it you know, yeah, you, yeah. my pride might yeah. come in like, oh, they don't get it, but I do, you know, so it, you might even feel more righteous in your own way. And that is also part of it. The Bible talks about the company that we keep. Yes. That's going to include family. And so unfortunate as it might sound, I wish I had the scripture, <laughs> but bad company spoils good character. It's the same thing with the people that we need to be delivered from as well. We might carry spirits, but we have people in our circle that carry spirits as well. And if I choose to be healed and delivered and move forward with this life, with the Lord as, as the head of my life, there are still people that are in my ear. Just like those spirits were in my ear all those years. These people are also carrying spirits. And so there are also influence outside of me externally that I need to be delivered from. And so we need to be delivered from people as well. And I'm not suggesting that people abandon their family. But I'm saying that there are people that act as influences and that those spirits can continue to try to manipulate to access and get you to come into agreement. And so the family is the best yes. option because you just happen to spend more time with family members or people that you're familiar with. So it's a lot easier to, to kind of slip up and slide back into some old familiar habits. That was First Corinthians fifteen thirty three. Oh yeah, I, yes. thought, I know it was in Proverbs too. What does it say? Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Bad part. Um, 
Absolutely. It doesn't matter that it could be your mother. <laughs> it's just, it says company. It doesn't say whether it's family or, or, or work people or people on your basketball team, it's company. So you have to walk out of here and evaluate. You have to reassess and evaluate that stuff too. Work friendships. Yeah. Like these are all voices. These are all people that are bound. And you might think that you're about to go minister and evangelize everybody. Right. But the truth is, is that it's really about your journey and you moving forward in this journey. If there's an assignment along the way, I'm sure they'll let you know. But for the most part, if you're in the wilderness, your focus is really about you and, and developing your character so that you are ready for your promised land, which is when you do move into ministry and you do function on the level that you, you're being called to function. I'm not sure this is really an after deliverance question. That might have been a better um, in the other the other yeah. section. I mean, I, I guess it's it could also speak to things that we may have missed. And, and I think that that would be a better yeah. way to question it. Yeah. Um, the question that we have is how do I get healed from family information that I don't know about? And happens I, I, often. I find that that happens often. A lot of people come in not knowing much about their mother's side or they might not know their father's side at all. That could hinder us from getting some information that we might be seeking to check generational patterns and things like that. And so the people that come in and they know both sides of the family, and they know their great grandmother on both right. sides, that person is going to have way more information that we can apply. And so we probably will have a more productive session. But the person that doesn't have all of that information, their concern is like, well, you missed something. Am I gonna walk out of here and there's some things that you missed? I believe that the education and the equipping is why you're really here. And the things that may have been missed those things will come in moments of grace and you will know what to do. So there will always be things that had not been addressed in your session. And so if it was meant to be addressed in your session, it will be addressed in right. your session. People start remembering things that yeah. they haven't yeah. thought about in years. He knows what he <laughs> wants you to be set free yeah. from. And that thing will trigger the snowball effect into your, your total healing for the most part. But when you walk out of here, those things that were missed, I wouldn't even say that they were missed. I would say that this was territory that he wasn't ready to move into and conquer yet because he was focusing on what he's currently focusing on. But when you get to that territory, you'll know what to do. You'll have had hours of practice in deliverance to where when you walk into that, you will know exactly how to address it. All right. So as, as far as how we... We slide into these videos and we slide out. We figure that out. But for now, uh, peace and blessings. And we we'll see you on the next one. Yeah. Have a good night. <laughs> good day. day. Good morning. Evening. Wherever, wherever you're at. God bless you.